especially in live cash games, most of the time when you raise, everyone else is either gonna call or fold, right? But there are gonna be times where you raise and then you get three bet, re-raised. The term three bet will be used throughout this masterclass as opposed to re-raise because a re-raise is not necessarily clearly um, defined, right? Because let's say there's a raise and a re-raise and a re-raise. Well, now is that the, the third bet or the fourth bet? The way the term three bet came around, by the way, is from limit hold'em, where there'd be a small blind, a big blind. If you called, well, you're calling the first bet, right? The blind is the first bet. So when you raise, that's in theory a two bet. And when you re-raise, that is a three bet. So a three bet here means someone raises, so let's say three big blinds. And now, or let's say we raise the three big blinds or three and a half big blinds. And our opponent makes it 10 big blinds. That is the third bet because the small blind was the first, or the big blind was the first bet. The initial raise that you made was the second bet. This is a third bet. So um, whenever you get three bet, very often, sometimes you're going to be against strong hands and sometimes you're going to be against weak hands. And we have to figure out how to defend, right? So if your opponent plays well, you should tend to defend at the minimum defense frequency or more. And again, very often more, because if you defend right at the minimum defense frequency, your opponent's probably going to profit a little bit too much with their preflop bluffs because a lot of their hands that they're bluffing with have plenty of equity. So you probably need to defend a little bit more. So let's take a look at a very clear example. Um, let's say you raise to three big blinds and your opponent three bets to 10 big blinds, right? Minimum defense frequency, we discussed this before, is one minus the opponent's bet, right? Divided by the opponent's bet plus the pot. And the pot here is your three big blind raise plus the small blind plus the big blind. So if you do this math, it comes out to 31%, which means you need to defend with at least 31% of your range. Now, Kind of going back to the example I gave where if you are defending the big blind, you should be way over defending. Same thing when facing three bets because you're gonna have lots of equity with your range, especially if you balanced it well by playing the ranges I recommended. So since your preflop hands will have lots of equity, you need to defend wider, perhaps 60% of your opening range or more, depending on the range you expect to be against from your opponent. So let's take a look at how the natural low jack or under the gun plus one versus low jack strategy happens. This is when under the gun plus one raises, folds around to the player in the low jack seat, which is middle position, and they three bet. Now under the gun plus one, this is if you open from early position, should four bet for value with the absolute best hands, aces, kings, and ace, king. You should four bet as a bluff with some hands that are not quite good enough to call. That's gonna be ace jack offsuit, ace nine suited, ace five suited, ace four suited, king 10 suited, and queen 10 suited. You should then call with the hands that flop very well, right? These are the strong pairs, best suited Broadway hands, and ace-queen. And then you should fold the worst hands in your range. And these are hands that are very often dominated or just aren't getting the right price to call. And this is um, a pattern that you're going to see very often against opponents who play well of re-raising your best hands, calling your stuff that's good enough to call, re-raising the hands that are on the cusp of playability but not quite, and then folding out the worst hands in your range. So as you see, it's usually going to go red hands, green hands, blue hands, and then gray hands. We'll, we'll see that as we continue going through a lot of the charts. But um, the minimum defense frequency and the general strategies for this situation where you raise and someone re-raises when they three bet is also in the charts. So make sure you go and you look at the charts. You may find that you feel uncomfortable calling with some hands. Like sometimes as you get wider, you'll be calling with some suited connectors. You'll be calling with some smaller pairs, maybe calling with king jack offsuit. Um, but in general, these strategies are perfectly fine, assuming your opponents play decently well. Um, one thing you may notice is that very often these big cards like ace-10 offsuit, king jack offsuit, and queen jack offsuit are used as bluffs. Um, so when you do re-raise here with ace jack offsuit, for example, you are bluffing. And you're bluffing with ace jack because when you have the ace in your hand and a jack in your hand, it's now way more difficult for your opponent to have aces, ace, king, ace, queen, and then also pocket jacks, right? So having that card in your hand makes it less likely that your opponent has a strong hand, which means that assuming they have a bluffing range, as all good players will, they are more likely to have a bluffing hand, which means they're going to fold to your four bets. And when we do four bet here, um, a pot size re-raise would be three times the last bet. So it'd be $10 or 10, 10 big blinds times three, so 30 plus any additional money in the pot, which would be your initial raise. So it's gonna end up being like 35 big blinds. However, as these stacks get shallower and shallower, in relation to the bet size, you can typically make it a little bit less. 
Like in this scenario, if we're playing 100 big blinds deep, you'll probably want to make it more like 28 big blinds. If we're playing 300 big blinds deep, though, you probably want to be making it more like 35 big blinds. So that's assuming your opponent plays well, right? Now, what if they don't play well? What if they play very tight and straightforward? This is going to be the case in a lot of small stakes live games, okay? You're going to raise, if they re-raise, they have aces and kings and queens and ace-king. Well, against that range, what should you do? Well, typically you're going to want to defend with hands that are getting the correct implied odds. Now, the implied odds we discussed earlier with the small pairs, um, essentially you want to be making sure you can be getting paid 10 to 1 at least on your set draw. So if you make it three big blinds and they make it 10, you have to put in seven big blinds more, right? So if you can count on your opponent paying you off for your full 100 big blind stack a decent amount of the time because you just know they have aces, kings, or queens, you can call with your small pairs, right? But let's say they're a little bit more loose and a little bit more aggressive. You should be now a little bit more inclined to fold because they're not going to have a strong enough hand to just mindlessly put their money in every single time. So against some players who are a little bit more aggressive, you need to be a little bit more inclined to fold, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Um, with suited connectors and suited aces, you typically want 20 to 1 implied odds, which you'll almost never be getting unless you're very deep stacked. So against very strong ranges, the only hands you really should consider calling with are suited, I'm sorry, are small pairs and medium pairs, of course, and the absolute best big suited hands. Um, and then hands like aces, kings, queens, and ace, king. Um, aces and kings especially, you're usually just best getting it all, getting it all in pre-flop. Ace, king, and ace, queen against a tight player, you should very often call and then play as we're going to describe in the post-flop section. Now, if your opponent's maniacal, understand that the implied odds hands go down in value, like the small pairs, but stuff like king, queen goes up in value because now if you make top pair, you just know you're never folding against a maniac, right? So against a maniac, you should be defending a larger portion of your range compared to if your opponent is tighter. But like I said, a different portion of the range, right? Which is something that you need to make sure you're really focusing on because you want to make sure that your hand has very good post slot playability, especially when you know you're going to face aggression and you really don't want to be sitting there with a really bad made hand that has little potential to improve. Like say you raise pocket twos and then a maniac re-raises and you call, flop comes nine, seven, six. If they bet, I mean, yeah, you have the best hand a lot of the time, but you're gonna have a really difficult time on the turn in the river if you face additional aggression and you will against a maniac, right? So a few more ideas. Usually your late position raises will face more resistance, okay? So whenever you do raise, you should expect to get re-raised more often when you're re uh, raising from later positions because your opponents realize you're opening with a wider range, right? Um, also, don't, cons uh, don't fall in the habit of uh, folding too often. It's so easy, especially when you move from small stakes to medium stakes live, like from 1-2 to 2-5 or from 2-5 to 5-10 to think that players are only re-raising with the best hand. So if they're only three betting with the nuts, you should be folding a lot. But as you play against tougher and tougher opponents, they're gonna be using this um, polarized strategy that we are discussing. And well, you can't just fold all that often because that allows their bluffs to immediately profit. So do not fold too often against competent and especially overly aggressive players. And you also wanna consider your pot odds and post-flop playability. For example, if you make it three big blinds and your opponent makes it six big blinds, well, now you should continue with pretty much everything because you have to put in three big blinds to win a 12 big blind pot. How hard is it to realize 25% equity with a decently strong range, right? It's not so hard. Now, of course, if your opponent re-raises to six big blinds with only aces, then that changes things again. And if you raise to three big blinds and your opponent makes it 100 big blinds or 40 big blinds, now you should just fold a ton because you're getting very poor pot odds. So let's take a look at a few examples. Let's say you raise with a low jack to three big blinds with ace-jack offsuit and the button three bets to 10 big blinds, all right? Now, if the opponent's a maniac in this scenario, you should pretty much always call, or perhaps four bet if you can be happy to get it all in for 100 big blinds or however, however deep we're playing with the ace-jack offsuit. Usually not gonna be the case though. So against the Maniac, you should call every time because Ace-Jack's going to flop strong top pairs, which are pretty great. And if the opponent plays tightly, if they're only re-raising Aces, Kings, Queens, Jacks, Tens, Nines, Ace, King, Ace, Queen, and Ace-Jack, well, now you should fold Ace-Jack because you're either flipping or in bad shape against your opponent's whole range. Um, we will be referring to the odds that you win throughout this masterclass. That is very important. Understand that you don't know what hands your opponents have, right? They have a range. And you need to make sure that you are accounting for the fact that sometimes they have aces and sometimes they have nines. But if you average that out, ace jack's in pretty bad shape. So with hands like sixes, you should tend to call against both players if they will mindlessly stack off 
post-flop. Again, sometimes the maniacs or the slightly more aggressive players won't, right? They're going to utilize the idea of pot control, where they have a decently strong but not nut hand, and they're going to check. And we're going to be discussing that again in the post-flop section. Um, with hands like 9-8 suited, you should tend to call against the loose player, because if you make a pair or a flush draw or a straight draw, you're pretty happy. But if we're 100 big blinds deep, you should fold against the tight players due to a lack of implied odds. You always want to keep your implied odds in mind. If you are getting poor odds to try to make your, your strong hand, if you call in this scenario, as a lot of small stakes players do, um, they call the 9-8 suited, they just bleed off that seven additional big blinds very often, and when they do win, they only win back like 30 big blinds. So if they, if they end up missing and they end up losing, I don't know, a ton of the time, what happens is they lose seven, lose seven, lose seven, lose seven, lose seven, lose seven, then win 30. And they repeat that over and over, and they've lost too many sevens to make up for the 30 that they win. So always consider the implied odds. Also, you should be more inclined to call from in position. If you raise and the small blind or big blind re-raises, you should be way more inclined to call than if you raise and say the button or the cutoff re-raises because you have to play from out of position. And being out of position is very, very bad. <laughs> being in position is very, very good. So and this is often why we are discussing re-raising a little bit larger from out of position, by the way, because that will uh, make it more difficult for the opponents to call because you've cut down on their implied odds and their immediate pot odds. Whereas when you're in position, yeah, you don't mind if the opponent falls, but you also don't mind if they call because they're going to be out of position and they're going to face very, very difficult situations. But um, as, as a very, very generic tip, in small stakes games, it's probably fine to fold a lot when you get re-raised. But as you play against better and better opponents, you should be way more inclined to defend and get ready to battle post-flop. So here is the Cash Game Masterclass. I spent a ton of time making this. I've been putting it off for a while because I've been working on a new way to share all this content with you and a new way to format it. And we have 29 lessons. They explain to you everything you need to know to crush the small and medium stakes cash games and very likely the high stakes cash games, including talking about equity, talking about pre-flop bet sizing. My favorite section here is the flop, where I go in depth on exactly when to continuation bet and how much, right? Because if you think about it, that's all you really have to do to figure out how to win at poker, right? Should I bet? Yes or no? If so, how much? And if you do that right every single time, you're just gonna demolish your opponents. And that is what I teach you in the flop section. And then I go through plenty of examples. Um, also, we do the same for the turn through the river. We go through many, many hands using uh, the analysis we use at PokerCoaching.com and the homework challenges. Glenn says that you are loving the Cash Game Masterclass. You already have it. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it. Here's something Mike said just recently. The Cash Game Masterclass was awesome. Since joining Poker Coaching Premium, you've gone from six big blinds per hour last year at 2.5 to over 13 big blinds per hour at 2.5. I put together my ultimate Cash Game Bundle. Here's what you're going to get as part of the Ultimate Cash Game Bundle. You're going to get the Cash Game Masterclass, beating 5, 10 cash games, crushing small stakes cash games, my live 1, 2, no limit cash game webinar, the live at the bike with me, combating limpers, the three bet home game, also live no limit cash game webinar, how to beat wild games, how to beat six max, and how to beat six max online games. That's a lot of stuff. Goodness gracious. So, Total value of this, $2,121. But obviously, I'm not going to charge you $2,121, which is what you'd pay if you just wanted to buy these individually, even though, you know, to be fair, it is definitely worth that for over 38 hours of training. So you can get this bundle completely for free when you join Poker Coaching Premium, which you can do right now at pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle. If you get the bundle for 30 days, does it disappear after 30 days? You can't get through all of it in 30 days. Well, if you sign up for Poker Coaching Premium, like we show over here, here, all the things in yellow are what you will get forever, assuming you do not cancel within the first 30 days. So that's the, all that stuff you just get. Like I said, it's basically like you're buying Poker Coaching Premium, or you're buying, a, you're buying Poker Coaching Premium, you're just getting all of the things in yellow completely for free for forever. The stuff that's not in yellow, you have to stay a member of Poker Coaching Premium to access. That said... If you're even spending an hour or two each month or each week, imagine you're spending, let's just say, four hours a week learning from myself and many of the other best players in the world we have listed here. Is it worth $25 an hour to learn from the best poker players in the world? I mean, I think it is. And then say you spend um, 10 hours a week 
or 10 hours a month, 10 hours a month, two and a half hours a week, not all that much time, right? Learning from the best players in the world. Well, $10 an hour. If you don't think it's worth $10 an hour to learn from the best players in the world, well, you may be in the wrong webinar because that is an absolute steal. Like I discussed earlier, I've spent over $25,000 on poker coaching myself, learning from others, and uh, I wish I would have spent more. Can we know how to play every situation correctly? Oliver, we can certainly give you a good fundamentally sound strategy that will help you know how to navigate most scenarios very, very well. Certainly there are going to be corner cases that are difficult to analyze in terms of um, you know, figuring it out on the fly, but that's why you spend time ahead of time learning about those scenarios. Your poker coaching member want to upgrade because the content is great. Where can you upgrade? Go to or send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com, and we will get that upgrade link for you. There should also be an upgrade link in pokercoaching.com. If you have not already, head over to pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle right now to get access to the cat the ultimate cash game bundle, including the cash game masterclass. And also sign up for poker coaching premium. That way you get the cash, the ultimate cash game bundle for free. It's just part of poker coaching premium, and you get access to all of those other resources. I made PokerCoaching.com to be the resource I want and the resource I wish I had when I was learning to play poker. And um, all of the students there are telling me that's exactly what it is, which was my goal. So I'm glad that I've made this and we're continuing to add to it every single month. We add lots and lots of new content because I know my best students are consuming all of my content. They're going through it, they're learning, and they're improving their skills. And I want to continue helping them improve their skills on a very regular basis. So head over to pokercoaching.com slash cash bundle now and sign up. So that's me it for today. Thank you for being here. Good luck in your games. Have a great week. And I'll talk to you next time.